thank you again for letting me talk today about something so interesting as uh, reinforcement learning in recommender systems. Um, it seems to be the trend that you should say who you are before. Um, so my name is Tim. I'm a senior data scientist. I have worked with machine learning basically the last 10 years, primarily with recommender systems and personalization. And I, now I have my own company where I work as a freelancer. And I do also, I do long time contracts as well as at advisory. Um, so please reach out if you have any tasks in that sense. Um, what I want to talk about today is um, recommender systems. I want to, to give a short introduction, then I want to uh, motivate why I think reinforcement learning could be a very good next step on where to uh, bring recommender systems. Um, so I would introduce them, introduce also reinforcement learning and bandits, and then show where how you can rephrase the recommender system to uh, to become a reinforcement learning problem and then i'll just shortly note uh, a, a couple of solutions out there um, i just tested this presentation and it took 47 minutes so i need to be a little bit fast um, so basically everybody knows what a recommender system are is um, it takes a system it calculates or provides relevant content based on the user um, the content or the interactions in between. You can divide recommenders into three types based on what data they use. So you can either say the content-based, collaborative filtering or hybrid. Um, I saw Alexei talk a little bit about recommenders also. So I would also, I think that people know the basic concept. But anyway, content-based means that you use the metadata or the um, the content itself to to uh, to find similarities in in the in your catalog. So basically, a recommendation means that you you take. Uh, let's do that later. Then, so for example, if I like the movie called Ex Machina, then what we could do we could have a system that would look up what categories that this movie uh, contains or is in. It's action robots that go insane and sci-fi, and then it could look up similar movies that had the same categories and and then produce the recommendation based on the similarity. Today, you do that with embeddings more than with uh, categories, but basically the concept is the same. The same you do with collaborative filtering. Here, instead of using the constant data, you use the behavioral data, or the user data, that is the interactions between the user and the items. So in a collaborative filtering model, you will find the items that the user has uh, has rated or interacted with, and then find similar items again, and then based on those similar or the similar items that you found, then do the recommendations in that way. Lastly, um, the last type of uh, of uh, recommender systems is the hybrid, and basically that just means that you take a little bit from both camps. Uh, for example, you can do a, um, a linear function between where you take output for both of them, or you can kind of interchange the, the two using data from both content and also collaborative. Um, I put this slide in here just to mention that most of the things that I'll talk about today is in the middle one in the collaborative filtering one. Quickly, what is the collaborative filtering is that basically what is the relationship between the user and the item that we can collect? And then you can split those things into explicit ratings and implicit ratings. Explicit means that the user has done something active to, to say that he, he likes it or she doesn't like it or so on. So for example, ratings, likes, thumbs up, thumbs down and so on, save to list are explicit ratings. Implicit ratings on the other hand is uh, click details about the con uh, click on details about the content uh, shown some kind of interest or what we can uh, interpret as something that is interesting. Um, it can also be negative that uh, somebody returns something or stopped halfway through a movie. Um, I saw this slide, I was muted, but I saw that Alexi talked about this also. So basically what you do is that when you have the interactions between the user and the items, then you create a rating matrix. So for there's a row for each user and a column for each item. And then if the user has interacted with the item, then there is a number in the cell. This is a very sparse matrix. so what the way that you want to do it is that you want to condense the signal inside of this matrix. And the way that you do that is by creating embeddings or using or creating user factors. Basically, when we talk about NLP or any most other machine learning 
models, we talk about creating embeddings for items, and this is just an early version of creating embeddings. Um, one thing you could mention is that what you actually do here is that you try and minimize create uh, vectors of uh, or matrix, user matrix, fact, user factor matrix, and an item factor matrix such that you minimize the expression that is in the bottom of the list. Um, some of you would probably say that, okay, so it's an AI conference, so why not just talk about neural networks or deep learning all from the beginning? And the reason why I, I stick to the matrix factorization and not some extensive uh, deep learning network is that there is an article that came out in 2019 at the REXIS conference that actually shows that a lot of the neural networks that seem to have gone to become state of the art actually could be beaten by a much simpler um, algorithms like item nearest neighbors and user nearest neighbors and so on. So stick with the old ones for now. And then if if you have to implement a recommender system, then start with the matrix factorization. And then you can always go and progress after that and see that you can get something more complicated to perform better. But to start out with, do this one. Another way you could look at, at uh, recommender systems is that instead of, of doing a rating prediction as what uh, matrix factorization do, you can also look at it as a list problem. So learning to rank, again, this was something that Alexi mentioned in regards to search, this is also something you do with recommender systems. The idea is that instead of, of trying to predict a rating, what you want to do is that you just want the order of the different items. So it doesn't actually matter if one item is predicted five or 10, as long as it's it's predicted uh, more than the ones that it should be on top of and less uh, than the ones that it should be under. And then that way you you get a, more, a better prediction, how to say space, where the items will, will be ranked in a better way. Again, when you do rating prediction, then it's actually what is in the top one is, which is called point-wise learning to rank. Then you can do the point, uh, the pair-wise learning to rank, where you compare two items all the time, and then the list-wise, where you compare the list. Um, pair-wise, there is something called the Bayesian personalized ranking, which basically um, what it does is that it uses the matrix factorization uh, model as a trainer, and then it just creates another function that you should optimize instead. So if you already did your matrix factorization, then the DPI is a good one to move on to. Um, I forgot to put a link to it here, but uh, reach out if you're interested. With all these recommendations, then basically we can get this uh, list of slates. Uh, you can imagine Netflix or, or Spotify or so on, and which creates this whole page of recommended items for you, which you can then um, dwell on and, and love. But the problem is that if you only see these ones, then um, it turns out that there is a feedback loop. So basically you see these recommendations, then you react most to, to those recommendations because those ones are the ones that are presented to you. But that loop will end up um, uh, reducing the number of items that are there and actually increase the popularity of popular items and then reduce the, the number of, of items in the sense the, uh, diversity is going to be reduced. So one of the things that you should be very careful with is that when you personalize everything, everything on your page, then actually you risk having to go into the filter bubble or, or have this feedback loop. Um, and actually this is one of the things that we would like to avoid. Another thing that you should consider is that when you do a, a traditional recommender system, then what you you kind of do a global picture or, or embedding of your user that has just one presentation. So basically, if I return to this page over and over and over again, then it would be the same recommendations. Of course, if other users interact, then the, the data will evolve and so on, and slowly the recommendations would also change a bit, but, but generally it will be the same. And actually, this global picture is, what if my mood is different one day? I, I like most sci-fi, but sometimes also like Italian crime movies or British comedies or something like that. And why the system should also be able to cater for things like that. Um, 
So one of the, the ideas has been to come up with a session-based or sequence-based recommendations where, where you, instead of looking at the user, what would be the next thing that the user would like most, then see, okay, look at it as a trajectory where you're going in some direction. Today, I'm in my uh, Star Wars mood, so I watch all the Star Wars movies and things related to that or, or something similar to that. The thing that is clever with this, um, this algorithm that Quadrana and, and the group uh, came up with is that not only do they then, how do you say, do the session um, recommendations, so it, it looks at it as what do you want to watch next and next and next and so on, but every time the session finishes, it kind of extracts the knowledge that it got from it and then looked at a user presentation instead, which it would then use to feed into the next session. And thereby, you would get more and more um, personalized sessions. Again, with the with the how do you say with the option where it can pick up on whether you are in the mood of watching I don't know action movies or cartoons with your children and so on. That's all good and nice, but again, if we optimize all the time for the short term, in the sense that what is it that I want to watch right now, I will then really looking into the to the best um, to the best way of, of making our users happy. In a sense, again, we have the, the fact that users get bored if they get the same recommenders, but can we make it even more user centric in a sense, even more for the whim that I have right now or for the user right now? Um, and there you have to start looking at the more long time problem of or long time optimization. For example, if you if you have a user that has watched or consumed two items at this point, what would then be the next thing to recommend? Maybe there is a clickbait YouTube video that will that is really hard for the user not to click at, but then the quality is so bad that you will the user will say, okay, this is enough for now. Or rather, should you recommend something that has a higher quality and would then have the user to stay for a longer time, risking that the user the that the probability that this that the user will consume it is a little bit less. That's the kind of the, the, the challenge that you should you should try and approach if you want to have kind of a increase the, um, the lifetime value of the users. So basically the things that that I just mentioned, there are more things of course, but this was just what, what I have time to talk about is that we would like to do the more user centric avoid the feedback loop problems, and then try and do long time optimization instead of short term, and then need for more diversity. That was it for recommender systems. Now let's move on to the reinforcement learning and multi-arm bandits. Um, so everybody has knows what supervised learning is, otherwise you would have fallen asleep long time before you actually arrived to my talk today. But so you, supervised learning is about that you have uh, an agent or a model that tries to predict labels and then it sends, it takes it with the environment and it responds with the true label. So if the predicted label was close to being the true label, you don't really know rather than it's just the right or wrong answer you get. While if you think about, how do you say, so you can see, say supervised learning is that you have a teacher that tells you what is correct and nothing else, while reinforcement learning is more like a child learning by itself. So you are in an environment, you can select, select an action and then the environment will, will reward this action. Then reward is, is also negative in this sense. So if a child lights something on fire or something like that, then a negative reward will also be considered a reward. The most simple things that you can talk about when you talk about machine, uh, sorry, reinforcement learning is normally A-B testing, but I'm going to skip that step and then move on to what they call multi-arm bandit. Just to start simple, let's start with a one-arm bandit instead. Um, basically, a one-arm bandit is a slot machine where maybe you can, right, you can earn more money there than you can in the stock market, who knows. Um, where the idea with the slot machine is that it has some kind of function that dictates when, you should, uh, when it should pay out winnings. So, the, the question that is, is asked is, should the user actually go and put a coin in this machine? Um, usually what you talk about is the multi-arm bandits and the user is standing in a casino where there is a lot of different machines to choose from. And then the question is, which one should he choose next? 
in the sense that if you imagine that you have, I don't know, 100 different coins, should you then use it uh, on one of them or you should use it on all of them or, or how should you do it? A very simple algorithm that you could use is that you can kind of start out random and then as soon as you start learning, in sense you can put one in each of them and then afterwards you would see it. You would see um, if you got returned from one of them, then you could just re keep using that, except for um, if you, I say, there is a probability where you say, um, you call this algorithm for the epsilon greedy. So you use the maximum all the time, uh, unless you hit a dice and you go below epsilon, in a sense that you, you take a random number between zero and one, and if it's below epsilon, then you do something random. And the reason why you have to do that is that you have to, as I mentioned to Vlad, was that you need to explore other areas because it's you don't know if the one that you think is the best one right now is actually the globally best one. It could be that the one standing right next to you is much better than the first one, but you just wasn't lucky enough to try it out now, so that uh, the function is still not known to you. Um, if we take that function also and then apply it to our recommender system problem, then you could say that the Q function that you use or the, the one to choose the maximum uh, machine could be your recommender system and then you could do an epsilon greedy on top of, of that such that mostly you will show your recommendations based on, on um, based on, on your recommender system, but then at epsilon times you would go and do uh, exploration meaning that you will show something random, or at least not recommended. Of course, when I say random, it means that you could choose randomly more intelligently. So you could choose between the new arrivals or choose something that is similar, but unviewed from what the user has consumed, which wouldn't be. Anyway, so there is many different ways of doing it. One of the ways that, um, that there is mentioned often is the overconfidence bound. And basically what you do is that instead of saying that you just do the maximum, uh, the one that has given you the maximum return, you then add the uncertainty you have on, on that item on top of it. So if you have an item that seems to do pretty good, but you're very uncertain, then it would be that one you were choosing. And as you learn more about it, then the distributions between what you, you think you get out of it gets more and more clear this uncertainty will decrease and you will actually end up with the, with the maximum or the best choice uh, to choose. That's all very nice and good, but actually what we are talking about when a recommender system is that we need to personalize. So until now, we just talked about what would one user do or what, uh, what machine should one user uh, approach. But actually we have a lot of different users instead which makes things a bit more complicated. And the way to get around that is that you use, excuse me, um, the way to get around that is to use contextual multi-arm bandits instead. And what you do there is that the other bandits, basically they just look on what happens if they show, if they advise you to use one of the, the machines or one of the bandits. And with the contextual, you say, okay, here, here is, uh, a little, here is uh, some information about the user also. And actually you can take it the next step also and say, instead of just having five machines, you have all your movies in your catalog. And then the contextual part of it would be half uh, information about the user and then half information about the, the, the movie. And then based on that, it should predict one of those ones. Again, it becomes pretty close to the recommender system that we already have, and this is something that can be pre-calculated. The interesting part with the context, contextual multi-arm bandits is also that you can add some more contextual uh, information about where, it are, where they are, what kind of system they are accessing this system on, and so on. What are they doing? Are they sitting? Are they running? Are they at home? And so on. Again, we have the, the problem that this is only short time, um, short time optimization because usually the, the contextual bandits uh, use clicks as, as feedback. Also because otherwise it becomes very complicated to actually understand what the feedback is. Um, 
but we still want to to do the long time long term uh, um, optimization, and for that we need to move on to full scale reinforcement learning. Um, Yes, reinforcement learning. And to explain a bit about what reinforcement learning is, I would start with a game. Because reinforcement learning is quite simple in its core. And, and of course, what I'll try to do here the next uh, 10 minutes or so is that I'll give you an intuition about what reinforcement learning is. And then I will show you some quite complicated solutions in the end. And then hopefully you can uh, correct the pieces in the middle. Um, so basically, if we have an agent, which is the one that is down in the bottom left here, um, I draw him myself, so I'm sorry if he looks a little bit cross-eyed. Um, he should go to the goal and he should pass as few steps as possible. So few steps means that we can motivate it to do that by saying that it's minus one every time it moves and it only gets a hundred plus reward when it arrives to the goal. Um, you can go different ways, of course. The agent can go up. What what I had thought about was that basically what the use what the agent should think is that it should go to the goal as fast as possible, which would mean go up if you didn't know that there was a it was a blind alley, um, and then it will end up getting zero, and then the other way around is to um, go around to get to the goal. Basically, if you look back and look at the bandits, what the idea is here is that if you don't have any information at all, then you should just be random go around randomly until you find something that actually gives you some some value back. So in the sense that this would just walk around until actually incidentally arrives to the goal. And the idea is that in this simple case, you can do a, a, a table where each um, position of, of the user, of the agent, sorry, is, is uh, denoted by a row and then each uh, direction it can go will then be um, we didn't have a value, so you could look at it as uh, as the probability that it should go this way, or or, or the how say how strong the value should be if it goes that way. So if it was 0 0.1, for example, um, then it was low, while 0 0.9 was something that it should for sure do. Um, we can calculate the values for each of the steps when it arrives to a goal and it terminates, for example, by saying that so it had gotten minus one, minus one for all the steps where it, it didn't arrive to the goal and then 100. So that would be 93 in the end. Um, you can then take and calculate back. So basically the first step that it did to the right actually was a good step. So we get some, some value back from, from arriving to the goal this way. Of, of course, it would normally end up with it having gone around in circles for a while before it actually does it like this, but just for the matter of being fast. Um, you use the, the, um, the expressions below to, to calculate what reward you got at each step. There is the gamma here, which is, um, uh, I actually don't know if you can see my mouse. Anyway, so there is a gamma in that expression and the gamma is what you call the decay. And when you talk about reinforcement learning, there is the the, the number of, of steps into the future should you actually regard as value, because when how short term do you want to have it? So is a hundred if somebody buys clothes for a hundred kroners next year, should that give the same value as if the customer did it right now? Um, that's something that depends a lot on the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, another way, so the what you saw here is what you call Monte Carlo feedback, and that requires a long, a long wait before you actually start updating the weights of your system. What you can also do is that you can start out um, having a random values on, on all your uh, all your directions in your table, and then you you do what you call bootstrap. So basically, you say I did I went one step, and then I got this reward, and what would I then get for the rest of the trip I have in that direction? And then slowly, as the bootstrap learns, how do you say, as the Q function learns more and more about how it's, it's um, how the actual values are, the, the better this thing gets. And, and in the end, it's actually a faster way of learning than it would be to wait until every uh, episode terminates. Of course, it depends on how long the, the episode is. If you talk about bandits, then an episode is only um, is always only one step. 
then it terminates and then it doesn't matter. So basically, if you have this table, then we can do this, what we call Q learning. <clears throat> so you are in a position with your, with your agent and you ask, where should I go? I find the, the point, uh, the row in the table and I look up and then before you decide whether I should move, I say, should I exploit what I know right now or should I explore? Again, most of these Q learning um, algorithms start out using the epsilon greedy as we already talked about. But of course, again, you can use more interesting uh, exploration uh, methods also. And with a table like that, then, um, then you can start saying, okay, so this table is of course very small, but you could do approximations of the table. And here we can start talking about using machine learning or deep learning as such. Um, and then you, you have what you call deep reinforcement learning suddenly. Um, one, one equation that I wanted to, to add is that I wanted you to just show you that basically what you always try to optimize when you talk about reinforcement learning is that you want to have the expected cumulative discounted reward. Um, you want to maximize that. And again, that was just the rewards that you get on each step when you do it. And you want on average, every time you do an episode, it has to be as high as possible. And again, the gamma is something that is uh, how much should your value decay over time. Um, when this is said, then I think I hope that most of you are ready to, to see that this is a reinforcement learning that we are talking about. So we have a world and an, or an environment. We have a decision maker, which is an, is an agent. And basically, the, every time it starts out in a state, the agent reacts with an action and then some interpreter uh, interprets what the environment happened, uh, what happened in the environment and, and it uh, it turns a reward and a state. Um, one of the reasons why there is an interpreter is that you don't always know the exact state that the agent is in actually. And if over a day or some day, then we can also discuss that the actual state that is returned when you talk about recommender systems is also debatable whether that is fully observed or not. Um, when you talk about um, Reinforcement learning, then you talk about the Marco decision process. So you have a, a tuple of sets of two sets and two functions where you have the set of all states, you have a, all the actions, which is uh, the states is each cell, the actions are up and right. And the transition function is whether you, um, is something that if you, if you go up, are you then sure that you actually go up or is there a probability that you go to the left instead? There are some called the, the icy lake problems where half the time you don't really go the right way. And then the reward function just saying that if you take this state and this action and you arrive to this new state, then what would be the reward? Um, hopefully now you should be ready to understand what uh, that algorithm that beat all the humans in Atari games uh, do because basically it's a Q learning algorithm. So it's an approximation of that table that we just saw. So if you look, um, um, laser pen, I don't know if anybody can see what I'm doing. Okay, so anyway, if you look at the algorithm that I took from the paper, you can see that you talk about an episode from episode one to M and it, for each episode, there is a, a series of time steps. And then we have the multi-arm bandit here or the epsilon greedy that select if epsilon, the probability epsilon select the random action, otherwise use the Q learning function, which is in the DQN uh, version is a neural network. So basically now based on this short description, I hope you kind of understand how things are moving along here. Then there is a lot of more lines that makes it more interesting to understand what is actually going on, but that's uh, for a, a later story. Um, what we talked about so far is the value-based version of reinforcement learning. Value-based means that you basically try to approximate the value at each of each action in each state. But the thing is that it's not actually the strategy that you're using always because you say, or we say that you have the 
you're standing in a state, then you have a series of actions, and then you actually only one minus epsilon take the maximum one. The rest of the time, you just take something random. Some people said, but can that really be the best way of doing it? Shouldn't we instead step back and say we create a policy that includes this, uh, this randomness into it also? So you can also have something clever to say from the model about what should actually be done. Um, one of a very good example for for why this would be good is that if you have two items or two actions that are almost the same um, has almost the same value, then in the value based version, then it would always take how to say the one that is just a slightly bit better um, and only choose the other one whenever it was doing uh, ex uh, exploration. While the idea about the policy is that it, you get a, a policy of all your actions where you can say that um, you get a policy and then you, you, you sample from that in the sense that it's a distribution that says that if you have two that are almost alike, then there are almost equal chance that that action will be chosen. And thereby you will also have some exploration included in it. Um, reinforce is one of the older algorithms that that were I say it was one of the first policy gradient uh, algorithms that were introduced and it's also still one of the ones that they use at Google today. Um, so this was reinforce. Oops, this again that looks different and okay. Anyway, so this is where um, I hope that you have a picture of recommender systems. I hope you have a picture of reinforcement learning. And it's hope this is where I look over the audience and see if people nod or they're on the way out of the room. But I'm sorry, I, I can't see you. So I don't know. I don't have any feedback on this algorithm. Anyway, so where do they meet? One of the things that, that I have been giggling nerdishly about is that in reinforce, uh, sorry, when you talk about recommender systems in reinforcement learning, then the hats are kind of switched because usually when you see an example of uh, reinforcement learning, then it's always the human that is the, um, how do you say, it's always a human with a hat that sits as an agent that lives in an environment. But when you talk about a recommender system, then it's actually the other way around. It's the agent that tries to select some items that us, the users, will react to. So that can create some confusion. Um, an environment is everything that could influence on it. So it could also um, to have a complete state about what is happening in your environment right now is could be whether it was raining or sunny or whether it was cold or warm or if alone and so on. All those things that are really hard for a computer to pick up unless you break some laws that you're not supposed to, of course. If you go back to the Marco decision process, which is how you define a reinforcement learning, then the way that you can do it is that you can say that a state is the, the user's consumption history before time t, along with some contextual information. What is important to, to remember here is that, um, that a state is not equal to one user. It's equal to a configuration for one user. So if I have watched um, Star Wars 1, 2, and then another user has watched Star Wars 1, 2, 3, then as soon as I watch Star Wars 3, then I become in the same state as the other user. So states means just what, what we have consumed as, as users more than, than, than each user is, is one, um, one state. It also, so that also explains how you can consider yourself as the agent that travels across this pane of different states, meaning that if you watch three movies and you watch the fourth one, then you move to the state next to it where that one is watched and so on. Um, with the, if there's more than four movies, it becomes a bit complicated to draw it though. Anyway, so the, the set of, of actions will then be all the movies which could be recommended and the transition function is again whether if you recommend something to the user, will they then actually watch it and transition to another state or will they just ignore it? And then the reward fix function will again, will be something that shows how, um, if, if the user consumes whatever was recommended or not. <clears throat>
recommended systems as the enforcement learning problem is there is problems. It's not something that is easy to solve. Um, I'm, I'm lucky in the sense that I'm just here to talk about <clears throat> how you could do it. So I, I don't have a solution to present to you guys. It, of course, there is a lot of solutions out there and there is research being done saying that it can be done, but it's something that is not really easy to achieve. So more research is needed. More people should try it out and, and get better at understanding how it is. Um, so one of the issues is the large catalog in the sense that you saw the drawing of all the, the, the multi-armed uh, bandits. Imagine that if you have a million different items in the marketplace or Netflix that has 70,000 movies and so on, then there is a lot of things to try out, a lot of actions to try out. <coughs> um, another problem is that uh, the things evolve. Uh, new users arrive, items are added and removed, which is also something that you need to do. This can this can be uh, solved by doing exploration and, and, and pushing things in like that. Um, and then the last one is that those um, DQN that, that uh, beat the humans in a tie, for example, they use simulations to get good at it. So they played against themselves inside a simulation. And I would encourage to encourage you to try out and do a simulation of the recommender system also. But actually, the problem is that unless you just replay the data that you have collected already with a recommender system that was not as good as you wanted, then you need to do a simulation of a good recommender system. But then you will actually already have solved your problem because then you would just use the simulation recommender to recommend things in the real world. Um, finally. I want to, to give a few, um, very few lists of, of, of examples on how, it's, how people actually uh, have done it in practice. And I have an empty slide here. That's pretty sure that was not supposed to be there. Um, let's move on. <clears throat> so I talked about the big action space. And one of the solutions that has come up with that is uh, to lock Arnold Edel that has found an article that has written an article about deep reinforcement learning in large discrete action spaces. Um, basically, what they do is that they create embeddings of the of the actions or the items in it would be items in our case, and then what the reinforcement learning agent predicts is a point in this embedding space, and then you you take a k nearest neighbor. Um, to find the items that are close to that uh, that point in the embedding space. And then you use uh, another model. So it, the next step of more complicated uh, reinforcement learning agents is uh, you talk about actor critic, where there are two models actually that, that cooperate against each other, let's say like that. And so in, in this example, the actor will find the embedding uh, point in and then it will find the K nearest uh, members and then the critic would say which of these ones are actually the best one. Um, another place where reinforcement learning seems to have gone to great success is uh, at Spotify, where they actually um, usually personalize or how to say higher click rate or, or better uh, optimization of recommender systems are uh, means that you go towards more popular items also as we talked about in the feedback loop but uh, also generally if um, the more you optimize the smaller the space of items that are actually returned becomes here spotify has been using re uh, reinforcement learning to actually show that uh, that they can come up with uh, recommending less popular items and more diverse items and the reaction by the users are, are good. It's better than before, which is surprising and something that is really great. YouTube has a, a quite a more complicated version of the reinforce uh, recommender system or the reinforce algorithm in their recommender system. I'll just skip past this fast, but I recommend you to read it. It's a bit uh, difficult to understand, but it's still very interesting. And one of the things that in the first article that they noted was that it takes really a long time to actually uh, 
include the user response into it. So in the in this year's uh, conference, they came back with an article where uh, Min Min came back with an article how they get um, they improve the the user response model so they understand faster and learn faster. Uh, just an example of that shows that it does actually work, at least in YouTube, is that you can, uh, the result of putting this into production, and here we're talking about the Slate Q, which is a Q learning algorithm that, predict, that uh, recommends whole lists of items. Um, it actually improved everything by 1% over three weeks. So, there are two things to mention about that. Three weeks is really horrible if you want to test something. I don't know, most A-B tests or, or, or trials of new models would have been taken out of production long ago. So three weeks that it managed to, to show that it could do something was incredible. And then you say, okay, but 1% is not really something that is interesting, is it? Because it's a small, such a small improvement. But if you think how big YouTube is, then imagine that you increase engagement by 1%, then that's insane. Um, one thing that you should consider is that until now, reinforcement learning has been very successful in games and robotics. And as you see a lot of examples on, you, you see the, what are they called, the Boston robots, robots that run around and doing police jobs and you see how all the video games and, and board games are being beaten by computers by now. But there is actually not so many successful user applications yet because of, of the knowledge is not there yet. It's also due to scale and user latent state and so on. But I think that it's a place where people, where there is great opportunities to to improve both your personal algorithms, but also to move forward in this field. Um, and as the last slide I wanted to show you is that what you can do to get started. And of course, I would recommend you to start with my books so you get a good um, good understanding of, on what recommender systems are. It doesn't talk a lot about uh, deep learning networks, but as I mentioned earlier, we don't need those ones anyway. Then I would move on to learning about deep reinforcement learning. And there is a, um, a good book from Morales that I could recommend. Then get some data and start studying algorithms. Basically, with recommender systems, the best thing you can do is to try and create a site and then find something you can recommend that you can view. Because it's only fun when you do optimizations, of course, with metrics, but also when you can actually see the results are good. There's a website with my book that you can then play around with. <clears throat> Moving to re reinforcement learning, then there are a lot of simulation tools out there where you can teach it to play um, a tie games, but also there are some uh, simulators now where you can also simulate recommender systems. <coughs> and then if you want to continue working on it, then contact me. Um, and that's my last slide. So questions. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Yes, we, we do have a couple of questions. Um, and not, not just from me, <laughs> also build bots. <laughs> um, one is, have you considered uh, using or deploying uh, GANs uh, in order to improve the performance of the reinforcement learning based uh, recommender systems? Um, <clears throat> yes and no. In a sense, I have considered it, but I haven't tried it out. So I'm, I'm not sure I can say whether it's a good or a bad idea. Um, you can say that um, in the reinforcement learning, there is kind of this um, um, two models that battle a little bit against each other in the actor critic. Um, for example, uh, I don't know if I'm still sharing my screen. Anyway, so where you do these discrete action spaces. There is the actor and the critic, and basically the idea is that they they kind of uh, work a little bit against each other to 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 push each other into to more um, um yeah. So I think without becoming very complicated, I, I think it's a good idea to try it out. But uh, 
I, I can't tell you whether it's something that is worth pursuing or not. Yeah, results may vary. Exactly. <laughs> okay, duly noted. Uh, also, um, how do you measure? Uh, speaking about evaluating uh, GANs or, or something else, uh, uh, how do you measure the performance uh, of a model? Uh, you know that there's a question. For example, uh, simple metric. Do you use simple metrics like uh, root mean squared error? Or what it would you use? It, 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 I would use so the result of a recommender system in what I think about is that you have this slate or list of 10 recommendations. So I would say if any of those 10 items are something that the user would consume, then I, I see it as a success. Then you can, you can, um, how do you say, so either you you split your training data and your test data, so there is only one element in your test data for each user, and then you say, if the recommender can find that one, then it's a good result. Otherwise, you go in and, and you look at the ranking of each of the items. So usually I would use precision at 10 or one of the other ranking algorithms. Also because if you read some of the scientific papers, then they are, they are saying, so um, precision at 50 is very good. But precision at 50, then I don't know if you go to Netflix and then you look at one of your rows, then how often do you actually scroll down to number 50? So possibly the precision of 50 would never actually work in, in real life. So so that's what I, that's what I'm using on the model that I'm training on my computer right now while I'm talking at least. Um, but it depends on what problem you're trying to solve. Yeah, I, I imagine uh, it would be also valuable to, to include some uh, some sort of a uh, time dimension, because yeah, if your if your model uh, on your uh, training set, uh, I don't know, recommends something, and in the test set the user consumes that something two years from now, it's most likely yes. a coincidence and not something uh, a good result. That would be a, a good next step. That's for sure. All right, I, um, yeah, the, those were the questions uh, <laughs> we had. Okay. Uh, thanks, sorry. I just said, okay. Ah. Uh, thanks so much, Kim. Uh, it was quite, um, quite interesting. I, yeah, I, I got some ideas. Yeah, tomorrow 